Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 35. Jesus is speaking and he's chatting with his disciples. If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two more with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he pays no attention to them, tell the church. But if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. I assure you, whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Again, I assure you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the slave fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that slave had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. But the slave, that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe. At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then, after he'd summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave, as I had mercy on you? And his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers until he could pay everything that was owed. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gee, there's a lot in that passage, isn't there? Uh, let me assure you, I am not going to cover every part of it. Uh, and that's why we have a question time after the sermon and morning tea. Uh, you have an outline there in your newsletters, uh, plenty of space to write. Uh, some questions up on the top right uh, for you to chat about over lunchtime. Let me pray and then we're going to look at the passage together. Father, thank you for the reminder from Psalm 119 uh, that your word is the joy of our hearts. Father, thank you for the reminder from Pat's word that we can actually romp through your word. Uh, It is a delight. It is full of good news. It confronts our greatest problem. It tells us of the wonderful solution you have wrought in your son Jesus. It is, most importantly, a revelation of your very desire and nature to us. Father, thank you that we've been able to read it this morning. Thank you that we have time to affirm who you are, who has spoken to us. Thank you that we can now think about your word. Please apply it to us. Make it a joy to our hearts so that we live as a people who reflect the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't think I'd be saying anything new to you if I said life in the community of God's people can be hard work. Uh, God's people are a bunch of fallible sinners. They're a bunch of people forgiven and restored to God. They're getting used to who God's made them in Jesus. 
In such a community, there is an understandably and rightly high expectation, a hope that in at least in this mob, there'll be patience and kindness. There'll be gentleness and mercy. There'll be steadfastness and humility. There'll be honesty and transparency. The reality can often be very different, can't it? And it can be very, very painful. Jesus knows that truth as he lives with his disciples. Uh, Among the 12 that are there with him in Matthew 18, there's a thief in charge of the money who is already plotting the death of Jesus. There are two brothers who've got a nickname, Sons of Thunder, so they're not great with their temper and anger management. Amongst the 12, there is a very precious superiority that says, hey, let's keep the kids separate and yearns to find out who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There's a laziness that when Jesus has gone away, the disciples try to take matters into their own hands, remember that? And they fail spectacularly. There's mixed understanding of what it means for Jesus to be the saviour of the world. Amongst the 12, there are political radicals who want to murder Romans. There's tradies and there's tax collectors who always seem to stumble. And that's only what we know from the biographies of Jesus. Imagine if we got all the details about the 12. As Jesus moves towards Jerusalem, he's preparing his followers for what life will look like in the kingdom of heaven. Remember what God said to those three on the top of that mountain when Jesus was revealed, this is my beloved son, I have great delight in him, listen to him. Because now you know what he is or who he is, he's going to prepare you for life in his kingdom as he moves to his coronation in Jerusalem. He's already started that back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 to 7. And when you read through that, Gee, it's a code of conduct that is amazingly high, isn't it? When you read through uh, what your glances, what your heart and what your desire will expose. Uh, In this kingdom, there is a king who is unimaginably perfect, who has a moral standard that is perfection and then spends his mealtimes hanging out with prostitutes and outcasts and misfits. It's a kingdom where the broken can get bound up, the high and mighty will be brought down, the weary will be given rest, and every citizen is commanded to grab a cross, just like the king. It's a kingdom where the king has promised to come and not just provide tax relief and good roads and great medical care, but to actually root out sin and to deal with its brokenness by living, dying, and then rising for his mob. It seems to me more and more as I've spent time looking at Matthew chapter 18 that at least in this chapter, Jesus is saying, this is what life is like in my kingdom. This is what my mob looks like. Uh, Now, when we get discussions about kingdoms and politics, uh, humans ask the inevitable questions, don't they? The disciples are great like that because they actually ask the questions we want to ask, but we're too scared to. Uh, They're not that wise, are they? They just ask those questions. Uh, You notice that question there in verse 1 of chapter 18? Uh, Hey, Jesus, this amazing kingdom, who's going to be the greatest? What a question to ask when the king has just shown that he wants to put no stumbling block in front of anyone. Uh, It's matched by Peter's question in verse 21 of today's passage. Uh, Actually, tell me the limits of forgiveness, Jesus, just so I know where I stand. You see, we like those kind of kingdoms, don't we? we? We like to work out the hierarchy, the pecking order, the boundaries, and how far I can go. Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 18, As he walks across all of life, Jesus responds by turning everything on its head. As Phil helped us think about two weeks ago, to be a citizen in this kingdom, to even even get into the kingdom, 
you must be completely dependent. Not independent. Completely dependent. That's verses 2 to 5. Completely dependent on a father who already knows all your needs. Matthew chapter 6. To be a citizen in this kingdom is to take sin and stumbling blocks very, very seriously, isn't it? Verses 6 to 9. You're not just a member of a kingdom where you follow the king, but just like the king, you take sin seriously and you put no stumbling block in front of anyone coming to meet the king. To be a citizen of this kingdom is to be someone who is accepted from every age group and demographic. The children are welcome in this mob through dependence on the king. To be a citizen of the kingdom is to have the same heart as the father of the kingdom. Verses 12 to 14. Who wants no sheep to wander off and who desires every sheep to be returned. What what a kingdom. What a kingdom. And yet, even in such a kingdom, God's mob still battle sin, don't they? God's mob still battle to forgive and reconcile and deal with sin and sins committed. And so uh, the question we face as we live in this kingdom, and notice, really important, this is just a message to the disciples. There's no hangers on here. This is a message for people in the kingdom. Uh, The question is not if a brother or sister will sin against you, but when they do, what, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to handle it as a member of the kingdom of heaven? Now, I think this is remarkably relevant today. Uh, it's, it's going to be relevant any day, isn't it? Because that's what God's word does. Uh, but I, I, we, we live in a remarkably angry age, don't we? I mean, one of the newest shows that Netflix is advertising is a show called The Beef where people seek revenge because of the slightest insult. We live in an age where opinions are extreme, aren't they? (laughs) Where there is anger and disputation. Where if you step out of line, condemnation is swift and forgiveness is absent and every failure is telegraphed very, very quickly. I heard someone say to me recently that our world has lost the ability to forgive. And so God's mob have something remarkably different, don't they? Remarkably different. God's desire is for the wandering sheep to be found. Uh, That's how the section in verses 14 finished. Uh, It should not surprise us that the same desire should be part of every member of God's people. I'm at point two on the outline. Look at verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two more with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he pays no attention to them, tell the church. But if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like an unbeliever, and a tax collector to you. God's desire is for the wandering sheep to be restored. God's desire, as we're about to see, is for the willful sheep to be restored. And before we go any further, let me just make a couple of observations, especially around verse 15. The if here is not like the if we use. Uh, In the Greek, there's a number of ways to express an if. And the way this one is expressed is not, ah, there's a possibility. No, this is when this takes place, (laughs) because it will. The assumption is that a brother or sister will sin against you. How how are you going to handle that? Your brother reminds us that we're dealing with relationships within God's mob. (laughs) We're dealing with how the community of the kingdom of heaven lives. We're not dealing with sins committed against God's mob by the world out there. Now, that's another passage like Matthew 5.38 where we're told to love your enemy. The issue here is sin. Did you see that? 
It's not a matter of maybe getting hurt feelings. It's not a matter of an unknown social faux pas. It's not even a matter of whether or not you like the form of the service on Sunday morning. It's a sin. It's a sin. And probably of the persistent and willful variety. Perhaps a campaign of rumours, a passing on of details third hand but never face to face, an attitude of denigration or a lifestyle of consistent, persistent immorality, a habit of rejection or refusal, a life that undermines the fabric of the community of God actively. The you, it's remarkable, it's singular. Jesus isn't actually talking to the mob here, he's talking to the individual sheep. It's not a matter of leadership, but a culture of accountability, a culture of love, a culture of restoration, a culture of transparency, openness, and a complete lack of pretense. It's a matter of sheep dealing with sheep in a way that reflects the desire of the shepherd. And did you see Jesus' very clear commands in verse 15? Two commands. Go and rebuke. Go and rebuke in private. In private. Put simply, Jesus commands his mob to be a community where there is open, transparent and kind conversation that confronts sin in relationship privately. If a brother or sister has sinned willfully against you, organise a time to have a cuppa and talk face to face in order to deal with the sin. And the aim of such a conversation, uh, let me say, uh, don't, don't think I'm saying this is easy. <laughs> it's a confronting conversation on every level, isn't it? I, I haven't met anyone this week who said to me, and I've chatted to a number of mates, what passage are you preaching on? I'm doing this one this week. Gee, that's a toughie. Everyone acknowledges this is hard. But the aim of such a conversation is restoration, isn't it? Not revenge. Not retribution, not kicking them out, but restoration through repentance. Look there in verse 15. If he listens to you, what's happened? You've won your brother. They're restored. It's no less than what God desires, isn't it? That a wandering sheep be brought back, that a willful sheep be restored. Sin is serious. Sin leads people to hell. Sin condemns humans eternally. Sin undermines the community of heaven. Sin damages the sinner and the sinned against. The desire of our Father is that none be lost. And the aim of such a conversation is for sin to be dealt with, sin to be repented of, and relationship restored. And I want us to notice that the restoration presumes listening, doesn't it? Did you see that there in verse 15? If they listen, well, if they listen, they'll respond. They'll repent. They'll chuck a U-turn. They'll come back. And the relationship will be restored and true life will be lived. Can you imagine what such a community would be like? Wouldn't it be wonderful? The kingdom of heaven, transparent, open, honest, gentle, kind, talking, a desire to see sin exposed, sin dealt with, sinners restored and relationship enjoyed. The kingdom of heaven where there is no whispering, there's no muttering, there are no third-party conversations, there's no triangulation, rumour or innuendo. There is humble and dependent desire to see sin confronted, 
sinners restored, God's mob to live as they are. Can I just say, it's been a confronting passage for a bloke like me to work on this week. Imagine how the disciples heard it. Imagine how we're hearing it. But in such a community, even in such a community, some will consider stubbornness and persistence in sin still the way to go. And Jesus actually lays out a very clear path, doesn't he? Did you notice that there in verses 16 and 17? But if he won't listen, take one or two more with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he pays no attention to them, tell the church. But if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. Do you notice how careful the steps are? Do you notice how Jesus doesn't move to escalation or the nuclear option straight away? Do you notice how Jesus doesn't just blow everything up at the first chance? This is careful, considered and steady. Dealing with sin so as to restore relationship and community. A series of steps in the wider community as sheep talk to sheep, only turning to the leadership at the very end. And there is an end point, isn't there? Did you notice that? There is a point where persistent and willful refusal to deal with sin, to repent, meets an outcome. And the outcome is separation. The outcome is separation. Sin is that serious. But I want us to notice who wrote this book. Who who wrote this book? Matthew. What was his job again? He was a tax collector. So, So Matthew is actually writing that Jesus says the end point is treat them all like tax collectors. What happens to tax collectors? They get restored. Do you notice that Jesus' heart is that even when there is a recognition that someone is persisting in sin, his desire, just like it was with Matthew, is that they still come to know and love him. It's not an eternal judgment handed to God's people and used willy-nilly, is it? It's actually a recognition of a fact. There is a persistent refusal to repent. And so I treat them like Jesus treated every other Gentile and tax collector, which was loving them with grace so that they return to the king. That is all very confronting, isn't it? To live in such a community with such openness is very hard. It can even raise questions about whether or not this is the right thing to do. Do we have the authority to do this? Is this actually the way it should be? Jesus answers that in verses 18 to 20. I assure you, Whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Again, I assure you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there among them. If God's mob pursue the desire of God, restoration, as sin is confronted, repentance is expressed, and relationship is restored. If God's mob pursue that, then it actually reflects what's already happening in heaven. That's verse 18. If God's mob pursue the desire of God by being dependent upon him, praying, talking, praying, and then acting, their actions will be granted by God. That's verse 19. If God's mob pursue the desire of God that willful and wandering sheep be restored to the shepherd, in the very way that Jesus has set out, who's there hanging out with them in the process of discipline? Jesus himself. The shepherd is there amongst the sheep. That's verse 20. Is there any such community in the world? There's no such community in the world, is there? In our world, every offence is weaponised. Every mistake is shared 
Forgiveness is often absent, and our world has perfected the art of excommunication, hasn't it? Can you imagine what such a community could do in our world? Can you imagine what such a community would say to people who are broken in our world? Can you imagine how such a community would reflect the very desire and heart of God that image bearers be made whole again? Such a community treats sin seriously and deals with sinners as image bearers of God. Such a community desires restoration through repentance, not the nursing of an offence, not the misunderstanding of an action, not the misconstrual of behaviour. And such a community reflects the desire of a king who wants people to be whole. So how many times must I forgive? Hasn't Peter got such a tin ear? (laughs) At the end of that, Peter goes, so just give me the limits here. Do you notice that? Look there in verse 21. I'm at point three on the outline. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times. We understand that question, don't we? Well, I do. <laughs> it's good to have lines. So I know how far the forgiveness goes. It's only reasonable to ask such a question. And in fact, Peter's been quite generous here because the accepted number in the common community was three times. So you'd expect Peter to have really nailed it. I mean, he's chosen the perfect number, hasn't he? Seven times? Double and more what everyone else expects? Surely that's it. How does Jesus answer in verse 22? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times seven. And it's actually a double-handed answer, isn't it? Because do you notice what Peter's first question was? How many times can a brother sin against me? Well, let him sin 70 times seven. (laughs) So how many times do I forgive him? Forgive him 70 times seven. On the one hand, that is an immense amount of forgiveness. Isn't it? Can you imagine keeping a tally book like that? On the other hand, Jesus has made a wonderfully intentional statement here about how he's changing the world. Because what did Lamech say back in Genesis 4? I want revenge 70 times, seven times. What does Jesus say? You go and forgive 70 times, seven times. Here is the sin of a broken world saying, give me revenge. Here is the mercy of the kingdom of heaven saying, give me forgiveness. Lamech cries 70 times 7. And Jesus says 70 times 7. It's a whole new world in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying there is unlimited, gracious and abundant forgiveness. If, if, you, if you want a hallmark of the kingdom of heaven, this is it. If the hallmark of the world is 70 times 7 revenge, unlimited violence, brokenness, then the hallmark of the kingdom of heaven is unlimited forgiveness. And I want you to notice This has come after the fact that we deal with sin seriously. Notice Jesus doesn't avoid sin. He doesn't avoid confronting sin. He doesn't leave sin to fester. He doesn't leave sin to spread decay. He tells us how to confront sin and then says, in that, know that the hallmark of the kingdom is this, unlimited forgiveness. Unlimited forgiveness doesn't avoid sin. You can't if you forgive, can you? Unlimited forgiveness deals with sin constantly generously and abundantly. Steve and Haley made that point, didn't they? Kids, you heard that story? We all did. It's great to see Lego Masters is back. It's a story we're familiar with. A king calls in his debts. A slave appears. One commentator describes it like this. 200,000 years of wages. $12 billion. 
$12 billion. I mean, I don't know how he racked up the debt. He faces the music. The king says, this is the judgment. The slave throws himself in dependence upon the king. Remember dependence? The king wipes the ledger book clean. The forgiven slave goes out. Do you notice that he actively finds another slave? Not by accident. He finds, goes and looks for one because he's got to start repaying this debt. Grabs someone who owes him 100 days wages, 200,000 years wages versus 100 days wages. Repayment is demanded. Repayment is impossible. The forgiven slave chokes him and then throws him in jail. He pleads for mercy in exactly the same words as the forgiven slave. Jesus is intentional. They're meant to mirror each other. The forgiven slave refuses, throw him into jail. It's taken to the king. Look at verse 32. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? Thrown into jail. The conclusion, verse 35. Listen carefully to how Jesus phrases it. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. It's an argument from the negative, isn't it? Do you notice that? And kids, you understood who was who here, didn't you? Uh, Who's the king? The king is God. Who's the forgiven slave? Well, that's the disciples. What's the debt? That's sin. God's mob have had all their sin wiped clean. An unimaginable debt. It's not deserved, not earned, not warranted. It's an absolutely generous gift, isn't it? Given out of the abundance of the power and majesty of the king. So how many times do you forgive? In the scenario, forgiveness is wiping clean the complete removal of the sin that's damaged the relationship. It's to remove it. It's gone. It's removed. In that scenario, forgiveness comes, did you notice in the last verse, where does it actually have its footing? In the heart. It's not a matter of words. It's not a matter of just actions. It's a disposition, a generous nature, not just on the surface, but at the essence. That's what the kingdom of heaven's like. Now, there are all sorts of questions we want to ask, and I've gone for a long time. But let me just close by making four very simple observations. The foundation of the kingdom of heaven is the desire of God and the action of his king, which is forgiveness in abundance. That means there is no community like this in the world which has such a hallmark. Such forgiveness doesn't avoid sin, but it confronts it so that people are restored. That means that the flavour of this community is unique. It's transparent and truthful. It's open and desiring of the good. It confronts sin, restores and forgives how much? In complete abundance. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for the way in which it's worked in me this week and we pray that you'll work it in others of your people. Father, thank you for Jesus who achieves abundant forgiveness on our behalf. Thank you for the king who forgives through him. Father, please make us a community that confronts sin to restore relationship knowing that our hallmark is abundant forgiveness. Amen.